Welcome back to <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to What Do You Know with Nick and Devin. I'm Nick. And I'm Devin. Woo, we're getting good at that. Yeah, this was like our second take maybe Smooth. on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh this one, this episode, uh I'm excited you're gonna be talking a lot during this episode Ooh, okay. at least in this first bit oh, uh, before okay. we get into uh everything i have to tell you and we're gonna we're gonna deep dive into your little brain a little bit <laughs> what is happening uh basically um i think i'm would make a terrible therapist and we'll find out why but um <laughs> next time <huh? laughs> okay uh, I want to ask you a couple questions to get into your psyche a little bit. Oh, okay. um, and I will tell you the reason why I'm asking these questions mm-hmm. uh, when we're done. Oh, um, okay. And uh, <laughs> am I making you nervous a little? The anticipation is building. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, we're going to be just doing a, a quick little test on you. Okay. Okay. Uh, no pencils, no pens, no papers, okay. no studying. Okay. There's no studying involved. This is just a pop quiz. Perfect. Pop quiz. Never studied anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Same. That's <laughs> great. Uh, so are you ready to begin the test? And start. Great. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so question number one. Mm-hmm. What is your most memorable childhood event, and how has that impacted you today? Oh, God. Oh, yeah, we're getting deep. Oh, we just dove right in. Um, Most impactful childhood event, and how it changed my life today? What is your most memorable childhood event and how has that impacted you today? Oh God. Um, I have a really bad memory. So this is going to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the first thing that comes to mind. Perfect. uh, Yeah. I think the first thing that comes to mind is (laughs) it's kind of like trauma ish, but like anyway, so it's a memorable childhood. It doesn't have to be happy. Right. Yeah. So me, my brother and my cousin, are all we're all two years apart okay um and so we would always hang out a lot um when our parents were working and so that we would go to my grandmother's house and she kind of like half raised us just right because, you know people had to work make money you know what i mean yeah. um so we're running around and the way the the layout of the house was there's kind of like the front area whatever but the kitchen was kind of in this like galley style uh-huh. and then it opened up to the back room and so the back room uh, when you get through the kitchen, it was like a step down, a little bit of a landing, another step, and then you were on the, like, the main floor, yeah. right? So we're running around. At the time, my cousin had a bed in that back area, um, and it had like a frame, like yeah. a metal frame, mattress, like all of that, right? So we're running, blah, blah, blah. We're chasing each other, all these things. And I go past the step. I go past the next step, and I trip – and I trip and I hit my teeth, Ooh. my front oh. teeth, directly uh. onto the metal frame. Yeah. So like frame to teeth, boom. Uh-huh. So then they go back into my jaw <sighs> Oh. Um, oh. because oh. where else are they going to oh. go? Yeah. So then I'm just like gushing blood. Of course. Because any head injury is like oh, just, doesn't just stop bleeding. Yeah. horrifying. It could be like the smallest cut and it looks awful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my aunt was telling me, she was like, I had a green shirt on that day, but at the end of the day, I had a red shirt on. <laughs> right. Okay. So I went to the hospital, obviously, yeah. uh, and they pulled all the teeth out. And then I had like fake teeth for a while. Um, that that like, is usually the first thing that comes to mind because I think it's just like so like gra- like so graphic from yeah, what I remember. Definitely. Um, and like it's a lot of pain. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and so that was that. I think the way that that changed – moving forward was i've always been good this is kind of weird but like i've always then been good in hospitals like okay. i've like i'm not scared of like going to the doctor getting treatment like i'm always kind of like i'm a proponent of doing that most of the yeah. times and i feel like a lot of people that i know or just people in general are just kind of like well i mean that could also be the healthcare system but like we don't have time for that um <laughs> and so um it's kind of affected me in that way yeah. and so like I think with that, when I had meningitis when I was a kid, um, which was bad, um, I almost got to be in a helicopter. Oh. Which would have been really cool, but they were, like, transplanting a heart. <laughs> or, like, whatever, transporting a heart, so I couldn't go in the helicopter. Uh-huh. So, like, well, I guess we'll put you in this ambulance. Boo. Boo. <laughs> and so, whatever. I was, like, dying with a spinal tap. Uh-huh. Anyway, so I would say that. Okay. That's a long story, but, like, yeah, that. Perfect. Okay. All right, ready for the next question? I'm ready. Describe yourself using only colors and shapes. Oh, 
Just like first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Like one color, one shape. Your interpretation. I immediately thought blue and square. Okay. And I don't know why. Okay. I think those are just the two things that, do you have an answer? Like, will you, like, is there going to be like a master key at the end? No. Oh, this is just what it is. I mean, there is an answer. Okay. I have an answer. Oh, okay. Uh, but whatever you answer is correct. Well, yeah. Okay. I don't like that, but <laughs> I like that I can't be right. You know what I mean? You are right. Though. I mean, yeah, 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 sure. Uh, blue and square. <laughs> That's correct. Blue and square. I think, I think to give background to that, I think because blue is kind of, blue is like one of my favorite colors. Okay. And then I just like the, like a square shape. I don't know. Like a perfect square or are you more of like a rectangle? A perfect square. Perfect square. Well, here's, mm, yeah. Perfect okay. square. Okay. Because I think if you're like a little off of a square, it's not like perfect, perfect. It's yeah. fine. I don't yeah. want like a whole rectangle. You, know what I mean? <laughs> you get it. You yeah. get it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, next. <laughs> <clears throat> Do you have any idea where this is going at the moment? Not this yet. is not question three. This is just a check in with you. Not yet. Okay. Question three. Mm -hmm. Describe why time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. Do you want me to read that again? Yeah. Describe why time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. My, you're using two different definitions of like, I feel like. That's my interpretation. Like you're saying that time is linear mm -hmm. and a fruit fly enjoys a banana. Correct? All right. <laughs> Question four. Wait, <laughs> this is a good time. Uh, how do you feel when you think about your upbringing and what makes you feel that way? This is a deep cut. Oh, that's, uh, we're getting real personal here. Yeah. Um, I mean, talk I, about it as comfortable as you are, like, right. as you feel like you can talk about it. Do you have it. a couch I can lay on? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think just like anyone's, well, potentially anyone's upbringing. I mean, I think there are very like traumatic moments. I think there's mm -hmm. like turmoil and there's, you know, there's those parts of it. Um, that I work through in therapy. Everyone go to therapy. Um, and that's fine. Yeah. Um, I think that it's a balance. I think that, you know, if it didn't happen, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. And mm -hmm. I'm, you know, comfortable with who I am uh, today. And so what are the things that I'd like to change? Sure. Are there very happy moments in my childhood? Absolutely. Right. And like core memories and things like that that I wouldn't want to change. Right. I mean, even thinking about like that first core memory, a lot of my memories from childhood center around my grandmother and going to that house and things like that. And that's beautiful. And I would mm -hmm. never change mm -hmm. that. And so I think it's just like life. It's just a balance of things. That answer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you say is an answer. Okay. <laughs> All right. Question five. There uh -huh. are six questions. Oh, okay. okay. So okay. we're almost done. Uh, any idea where we're going so far? I don't know. Okay. I'm not there yet. I don't it's know. It's okay. It's I'm okay. not connecting the dots. Uh, question five. Mm -hmm. uh, what historical event changed you the most, and where were you when it happened? Mm. I feel... I feel like our generation, it's very... like My first instinct is to say 9-11. Exactly. I was about to you know say I, mean? I didn't want to... Uh, bring you there yeah um, by saying that but i feel like with our whole generation totally that's like the biggest <laughs> i think i think totally i mean like that was the first thing where one something could happen like oh my god something could happen on american soil right. you know what i mean that we're right. alive for right. um and two i remember i was in third grade mm -hmm. um we were in class and it kind of came over the speakers the teacher put it on the television really quick and then they sent us home okay and so, like, we just, we went home. Because yeah. I think the big thing was, especially being in Chicago, mm -hmm. there was a lot of uh, concern that the next potential attack was going to be in a major city. Right. And, like, the Sears Tower and things like that. Like, that's a big, um, it's a very tall building. It's a big target. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, I just remember, that's the first time seeing my family, like, kind of engage over like a big news event like that and not just like discuss but mm -hmm. we went to my aunt's house we're sitting there the tv's just cycling and cycling and cycling and even us as kids weren't just kind of like off playing like we were sitting and watching you yeah. know what i mean yeah. and i think most times when big events happen as kids or things like that you know there's kind of a separation like mm -hmm. you know you see what's happening but you're kind of playing in the background right. um but this was the first time where it's like we're involved in a very major story yeah and my aunt worked next to sears tower at the time and oh, wow. so like it was a very big like are you on your way things like that um you know not everyone had a cell phone at this point you know what right. i mean like right. it was just a very different time yeah. and so there was just a lot of concern and panic yeah okay all right, next. Question six, final question. Okay. 
which of the previous questions was the most difficult to answer and why? Um, I think, I think probably like describe how you feel about your childhood or even like the first like memory that comes, core memory of your childhood that comes to mind. I think one, it's hard to discuss in general mm-hmm. for me. Um, just like, I don't know, I don't want to get that personal with everybody. Um, and two, like this can potentially be a very broad, <laughs> right. uh, broad audience. And right. so it's just kind of like you kind of play the game of what do I say? What do I don't? And so it just gets a little bit trickier. Um, but I would say probably more so. Yeah. One of those two. Okay. What is happening? Here? Interesting. What is this? All right. Based off your answers <laughs> and, uh, based off of my notes, uh, put the scantron in, <laughs> I have finally determined that yes, indeed uh-huh. you are human. It, is this like an AI thing? This is. Uh, those were example questions of the Turing test to determine. Oh uh, my god! <laughs> How did I not see this? Oh, uh, then so dumb. No, no, you're not dumb because there there aren't any. There isn't really a set list of questions to go through the Turing test. Sure. Um, because well. First off, the Turing test, uh, for those of you who don't know, yeah. is a test to, dis- to determine um, if a machine, robot, AI, um, can be uh, indistinguishable from a human. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so there aren't any, uh, there isn't a set list of questions because otherwise they'd be on the internet. The machine could learn those questions and learn right. the answers. So we kind of have to switch them up. Um so that's you just completed a Turing test. That's great. Like we study this in philosophy, yeah. um, which is a whole different thing. But it is crazy because there's a lot. I mean, Chat GPT now. I mean, even two years ago, AI and all of that wasn't what it is now. Or no. not as accessible, right? To it what just it is blew now. Up. Huge. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's really interesting because that's the next kind of question of like can a computer become sentient right and so turing test obviously is a very big excuse me um the turing test is a very big like you know way to distinguish those things Mm -hmm. but like that line starts to get blurred more and more and more and more absolutely and so that's very that's very interesting yeah because you okay go ahead no go ahead no i was just gonna say like (laughs) because then you start getting into i think a computer and an ai is able to learn and manufacture you know, questions and answers that you might not be able to fact check yes or no. Right. And so it kind of starts to go into like syntax and start to go into like these feelings and things of that nature. But the closer you get to this line of sentience. Yeah. I think, right? Yeah. Um, The more you start to like fear AI as compatible with humanity exactly and so you start to have this question of well what can anything else be a human that isn't a human human so to speak right right um what is a human at the end of the day correct when you're creating life yourself what correct yeah right and do you have the right to like play god in that way anyway okay go ahead it's a massive conversation the philosophy of uh the turing test and ai in general is just uh, a deep web of thought yeah and it's crazy. It's very fun. So I'm going to um, get it a little bit about just explaining what the Turing test is okay. briefly because I want to have a deeper conversation about uh, the philosophy of uh, what is thought, essentially. Totally. Um, and I also did ask two separate uh, AI chat functions. Um, uh, I did chat GPT mm-hmm. and then Google has one named Bard. Yes. Um, and so I did run these questions through both uh, of these uh, AI chat functions. And their answers were interesting. Chat okay. GPT, not as interesting as I thought it would be. Bard had a lot more interesting questions. Or uh, answers. Okay. Um, so uh, just to get into uh, the Turing test and what it is a little bit, um, it was invented by Alan Turing in mm-hmm. 1950. And it was originally called The Imitation Game. And um, If you haven't seen the movie, see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Better come back. Uh, the game was um, to be played by three people. Player A, uh, described in Turing's paper, um, the uh, the game was played by three people. Player A was male. Player B was female. Player C, it uh, didn't matter your gender. Um, and player C can't see the other players. 
mm-hmm. they can only communicate to them through uh, notes. And um, the object of the game was to have player C correctly determine the genders of both uh, of player A and player B. Um, and player A was supposed to try to deceive player C mm-hmm. um, and trick him. And while player B uh, was trying to assist the question giver, player Got C. It. Okay. Um, so that's the imitation game that you can play parties, whatever. Um, but we, uh, Turing took this game and made it to ask the question, can machines think? That's how he opened his paper. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, his paper, for those of you who don't know, is called Compute- Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And he wrote it while he was at University of Manchester. Um, opening line, can machines think? And so he wanted to play this game with a computer to see if it could uh, trick the judge, trick player C, into um, thinking that they were, the machine was the human giving the answers. Mm, okay. Um, and so uh, part of the object and the, the interpretation of this game, of this test, is to not specifically determine if a computer can like fool a human, uh, that they are talking to a, a fellow human, um, but whether or not the computer could imitate a human. So like it's just indistinguishable between, oh, am I talking to a machine? Can the machine um, express human emotions yeah. is the big part of it. Um, and so part of the philosophy, though, is what is thinking. It, like, what is thought? What makes a human human? And how do we put those values on a, a machine, an inanimate object, a, a, a thing we as a human have created ourselves? Yeah. Are we God? <laughs> what is God? <laughs> yes. yes, yes. <clears throat> um, and so some of the arguments... Um, for uh, machines being able to think, like saying that mm-hmm. uh, a machine can think. Because thinking, uh, the definition of thinking, according to a dictionary, is a process of using one's mind to consider or reason about something. So an argument, for, some arguments for uh, machines being able to, yes, they can think. We're good to go on that. Um, They can be programmed to perform tasks that require intelligence, uh, such as solving problems, making decisions, learning from experience. We're already seeing that with AI. That's the whole point of artificial intelligence is learning and building off of previous uh, subjects and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, So they can perform their tasks better, so they can grow in intelligence. Um, I know there's like a, a Boston... Boston Robotics, I believe the company's name is. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have built robots. It's not just a chat function. It's a robot that is learning how to jump over objects, how to exist in our physical uh, yeah. world. And those videos are always crazy to see. I'm like, oh, oh my God, God I yeah. learned. <laughs> well, and it keeps on learning how to, because at first it's so rigid. And then it learns how to bevel. And it learns how to stumble. And it yeah. learns how to like lean and like the fluidity like the fluidity of motion in a human like just you see the progression and you're like oh do we want this like hold <laughs> on, fuck. i'm always brought back to like whenever this conversation happens um or like whenever i see those videos it's back to irobot totally um either the book or the movie uh-huh. uh and i'm just like oh my god and like you just kind of hope that there are some type of uh restrictions um that are built into these robots um because like from my robot um and just isaac asimov in general he and created um the author of irobot and many other science fiction books um he created uh the three laws of robotics and um i wish i had put them in my notes so i could have the, like, <laughs> the exact wording but like uh law one is like the, essentially the laws are um Robots can't harm humans mm-hmm. um, or uh, like they can't cause harm or bring harm. Or, um, they have to like stop harm happening to humans. Um, and uh, robots like need to defend, like take care of themselves, I think is law two, unless it conflicts with law one. So like you can't, you always have to prioritize human life over robot life. Right. It's essentially all the, all the, laws say um so i'm always like man i hope i hope we program that. <laughs> something along those lines there are a lot of flaws with the uh, laws of robotics yeah. 
Um, cause then like you can branch out and talk about all that. Um, but like just something. <laughs> well, and like, so I was watching a video and I didn't fact check. So I just want to put that out there now. <laughs> yeah, right. But basically talking about how AI, there was kind of a government program within the defense, um, within the defense branch that basically programmed a robot to, or like AI to take a drone, be able to like intercept missiles. Okay. Right. Yeah. So there's an operator, a human operator, that's like, all right, go ahead and destroy this one. Goes and it destroys it. And it's like, my main function is to destroy these things, yeah. right? And so then they're like, the operator's like, okay. So it like recognizes another missile is going sent out. And the operator's like, no, we're not going to destroy that one. And it's like, no, like, we are. So there's like some conflict right. between, and so the robot, or the AI started to turn on the operator. And so they're like, okay, shut it down. We'll reprogram it, all these things, right? Yeah. Like, we're not going to play around with that. So they reprogram it, they set it up again, they send out a missile, it destroys it, send out another one, that destroys it, sends out a third one, it's like, okay, we're not going to destroy that one. And the AI gets so confused and so, I guess, angry in a way that it's like stopping its main basic function, that it destroys the communication tower to then be able to do what it wants its to do. Its own directive. Right. Oh, that's when we get into Skynet and the Terminator. <laughs> right. <laughs> where I'm just like... <laughs> we shouldn't give them missiles. <laughs> right. Well, this is where I'm just kind of like, this is this is where it's like, okay, now we're starting to find the line. Yeah. Right? So right. how do we start to prevent that line? And I think I think in the years to come, like very, very soon, the next year or two, whatever, um, we're going to start to see like legislation oh, and things 100%. like that starting to be implemented into like drawing those lines. But I think especially in the United States military that gets blurred and like yeah, crossed absolutely. all the time. Right. So that's where I think our detriment could be. But anyway, keep going. Yeah, no. robotics. <laughs> <laughs> well, cause I like, I heard on the news this past week that, um, there are folks talking about the future of, um, space, uh, tourism. That's the word. Mm, yeah. Space tourism could be with AI cause they're trying to reduce, the weight of the spacecraft going out into the stars mm -hmm. um, for the common folk. And by common folk, I mean billionaires. Right. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, they would remove some human elements and remove some bits and pieces of like a regular NASA rocket going out or space shuttle rather going out so that they could reduce the weight and reduce the cost of sending folks out into space. And they would rely on AI. But then talking about like, the AI going rogue <laughs> being like, I'm going to destroy this missile anyway. I'm like, do I want to trust an AI to take me out to space? But not only going rogue, but also like if there is a malfunction with the computational system, I want someone on that ship that Who knows, knows what they're doing. <laughs> that can manually override and knows right. what they're doing. Right. And not have a time delay. I mean, I don't know what the time delay is between like uh, Houston and the ISS right. is at the moment, but like, I just don't have enough faith in technology i love technology i think it works great <laughs> i think that's amazing but i've also seen it fuck up all the time way too much right don't have enough faith and i don't think ever will no to allow something like that no i think our generation can't because right. we like we saw the the rise of a cell phone right <laughs> you know right. like we were starting off with like giant bricks when we were kids truly so like Insane. Now. <laughs> right. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, so some more arguments for um, machines that can, uh, machines can think. Argument for uh, machines are becoming increasingly sophisticated, capable of performing many tasks that were once thought to be exclusive domains of humans. Um, so uh, factory work, yeah. I guess, would be an example. Um, and then there is no clear definition uh, of what it means to think. And it's possible that machines can think in a way that is different from humans. Like we, that's mm. saying like humans have our own definition of thinking, um, but you can also see like dogs thinking in a different way or dolphins. Sure. But, so like why can't robots or machines uh, have just a different way of thinking? Because um, uh, from there you could argue an argument for that point would be um, humans can only see a, a certain wavelength of light. So we can only f see certain parts of the world, but like uh, a different being, a different animal on our planet are able to see different wavelengths, right? different parts of the spectrum. Um, so they could see the world completely different, see things that we're not. So why can't a machine think in a way that humans can't? Correct. So, okay. Yeah. Um, 
Let me see if I remember this experiment correctly. Uh, there's a thing called Mary's experiment, and I don't remember the philosopher. Mary's? Now. Mary's. Okay. Um, and I don't remember the philosopher at this point. But basically what happens is you put um, a researcher in the hole, and let's say Mary gets put from birth, is put into this capsule, and does not have any interaction with the outside world. Right. And Mary is in a black and white room. Um, computers... All she does is learn and learn and learn and learn. She knows every source of light, every source of color, understands it, like all the functionality of it, all the science behind it, all of these things, like can immediately say that's red, that's blue, like without seeing it, knows it. Okay. Right? Fully understands it, all these things. But she's only in a black and white space. But she's only in a black and white space. Okay. Right? She eventually is let out of the capsule. Yeah. um, And sees the world in color for the first time. That... She can see and distinguish this is red, this is blue, this is green, this is this color, all of these things. She fully understands that all of that from a scientific background she gets, she understands all of those things. Right. Her experience seeing red, seeing a rose, a red rose for the first time yeah. is the distinction between a human and a computer. You cannot recreate that experience and recreate that feeling oh, and recreate okay. that like – I feel like we play a lot into emotion at that point. And yeah. I think that that can be like misconstrued in some ways, but that experience of Mary seeing red for the first time in that environment or seeing red in general in a different environment, that sort of experience is just so unique yeah. to her and to a person and to a human um, that it cannot be recreated. And so there's this kind of aspect of when Mary's in the hole, learning everything about color and, you know, light introspection and all of these things, that's a computer. Right. A computer can learn and understand and, you know, distinguish between all of these things. But that aspect of actually seeing something and the ability to um, to describe that and be yeah. able to kind of convey that to an audience or to another human or to even to a computer is what innately makes us human. And so that was kind of the thought experiment okay. of this is how we kind of placate this into – like an actual human role versus just like, well, a computer's a computer and a human's a human. It's like, okay, how do we make those things relatable? And this is kind of how we do that. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 (laughs) (laughs) That's it. No, no, I know. I'm I'm, uh, just like uh, the Jedi code episode. Like I was really just excited to hear, uh, tap into your like philosophy knowledge sure. about it and just yeah, be yeah. like, all right, so what do you have to say? Like, right. me, like for me and AI, I am both intrigued and uh, n- not scared, sure. but like curious, I would say of like where this is going to go. And like after watching and reading so much sci-fi content, I'm like, okay, so where is this going to bring us? Right. What, what leap um, in life is AI going to bring the human race? Yeah. Um, because, uh, like we've kind of said too, our um, our generation seeing this explosion of technology development um, from, uh, I mean, being born in the early '90s, the internet was still very brand new, mm-hmm. um, uh, and having that the internet just develop and see the growth of the internet exploding to what it is now. I mean, like when we were kids, there was only I think maybe one or two uh, internet, uh, I'm going to say inter- uh, internet browsers. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you had Netscape, you had like, I think Opera might have been one of the first ones sure. and now it's still around. Surprise, it came back. Really? It came back. Okay. <laughs> We're okay. Um, and so like just that information boom of the globalization of uh, people being able to connect and learn from each other. Yeah was huge so is ai the next big jump for the human race of connectivity of growth of are we gonna have flying cars now <laughs> Dude, i mean i think it it kind of automatically allows you to take that huge next step because instead of and i think there is like progression in the sense of human curiosity and human um you know trial and error yeah um i think we always well, within recent years, we've always had, like, internet at our fingertips. Right. But only so much that a human is putting onto the internet. Right. You know what I mean? But now I can have a computer scan the entire internet, 
and give me the answer and like try different models and try different computations so much faster. Right. That progress, I think, is just going to take off. Yeah. I mean, even looking at like a very trivial level, like looking at Microsoft 365's uh, virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Things like that. Clippy. Whereas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bring back Clippy. Um, Justice for Clippy. <laughs> but I mean, like, I think it changes the workforce. I think there yeah. was a very big, like, 90s technology push, like, into the early 2000s where robotics took over a lot of factory jobs, took over a lot of automation aspects and things like that. A lot like of the blue-collar stuff. Correct. Yeah. And I think you're just going to start to see that more and start to get into the actual, like, corporate world as well. Right. Because there will be a lot of assistants that won't, from AI that is helpful, but then kind of starts to negate uh, like a human's need. job. Yeah, yeah, and need. You know what I mean? Now, I think, I think we're going to see an ebb and flow of that, right? I think we're going to see a full push of that. And then we're going to start to realize, oh, we need to have a human touch that a computer can't do a personalized touch like that. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. That maybe technology hasn't caught up with. Just like brick and mortar. You know what I mean? Like we had this huge push of brick and mortar businesses and then automation and online shopping and all of that came in and like all of this brick and mortar fell. And now we're saying, well, I want the experience of going into a store again. And you're starting to see this resurgence. You know, right. like it's just constant back and forth. And I think we're going to see that with AI as well. Definitely. It's just a matter of how far do we take it? Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's kind of the next thing. I like to think that it'll be like very star wars positive like, right. well i mean like there's a lot of negative things in star wars but like like a draw like a droid war like are we gonna see that <laughs> yeah, right right um but in that universe you know robotics are oftentimes like seen as like just like, servants servants yeah. you know what i mean and that's gonna get into like a, yeah and that's also gonna get into like a whole like okay well at what point does a robot become like more than own, a tool more than a tool yeah. but even if we see them as servants ethically do we still allow that do we not do they become their own like class of thing like right. what how do we treat right. that you right. know what i mean and i think that, i mean that's years and years and years and years <laughs> down the road um but i think that's like a big also like philosophical question is like at what point do we allow something to be move from being subservient to like equal to you know what I mean? Yeah. And so something that we don't like control. Yeah. They're um, part of the, I mean, the main story of iRobot. Um, and then there's also um, this video game series called Mass Effect. Okay. Uh, and part of it, um, these uh, people create robots as they started out as servants uh, and created artificial intelligence. And they feared these robots that they created. They're called the Geth, the robots. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, when they, the robot that Geth started to ask, do I have a soul? Like, do we yeah. have a soul? Because it was a like hive mind for them. They were all connected, one conscious. Um, and so that's when uh, the Koreans, the people who created them, mm -hmm. uh, were like, this needs to shut it down. Done. Like, you, you've become too sentient. Like, this is it. Right. Um, and same thing with iRobot. Um, the main robot is, is like, I. this is my name. I'm not numbers. This is my name. This is who I am. Do I have a soul? And I think that is the point where a lot of, at least in a lot of the stories, is when people start to freak the fuck out about artificial intelligence. And mm -hmm. I wonder if like that's also going to be our point is like... Right that's when the ethics start really coming in. Well, and I think, I mean, that's a whole other question in and of itself is, do we have a soul? You know what I mean? Because that's such a, and whether it's a soul in the sense of like very religious thinking of like an actual like spirit that lives in us and right. all these things, or even just something that makes us distinctly human. Am I just a be like, am I a being Right, now? is there something yeah. that just lives in, you know what yeah. I mean? Like this kind of consciousness. And that's where also consciousness comes into play is like, what is consciousness? Right. Um, and that's like a whole... Everything kind of ties together in a lot of ways, right? Because <laughs> yeah. the question is like, who am I? What am I doing here? And all of these things. And so you kind of dive into many different aspects of that. Right. And so within within this aspect of just like having a soul, you know, what do you define as a soul? You know, like, is it just something that 
allows me to experience things and have emotion and, you know, have feeling and critical thinking, or is it this thing inside of me? And so if an artificial intelligence is starting to say, do I have a soul? I don't necessarily see that as scary quite yet. I think it's more so like, do they understand what a soul is? What's our definition of a soul? And like that sort of thing. Um, but I mean, I, you start to, like, again, like you start to blur that line. Right. And I think that's a huge thing. I mean, two Will Smith movies. I think about I, Robot, and I yeah. think about I Am Legend. The cool thing in I Am Legend is at the end, he sees, like, this painting of himself, and he thinks, I've become this legend to these zombies. Right. So now they've kind of become the superior race, and I am this thing of myth and this thing of, like, of a god, so to speak, right? Like, we yeah. create myth to... Um, make sense of the unknown and Mm -hmm. make sense of things and this is how they're doing it and so does a robot like artificial intelligence let's say that they start to take over does that same thing start to happen right do they start to create myths and stories and like original thought in that way Mm -hmm. or is everything just this computational whatever's being input is being output right right and so i think that's another big distinction there is what does what is the input what is the output and do they have the ability to create original thought yeah i i feel like in a lot of the science fiction stories there's always when shit goes wrong it's always because like the prime directive that they program into these robots is uh like create a safe world protect humans um something along those lines sure. and so um the computer compute uh goes through this process and computes that the best solution is to eliminate human life (laughs) and that is going to create the best the best world because humans are so flawed they always are fighting war yada 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 um and i that's usually like just following that prime directive is when like shit hits the fan and it's like where what's the kill switch you know what i mean like do you say always advise humans on what is the best course of action instead of saying always protect Take, humans, yeah. right? You know what I mean? Instead yeah. of being so commanding, yeah. do you then kind of make it a little bit softer? Right. Um, but it's, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's just, I think that's a big thing of, of consciousness of can a computer have free consciousness? Um, yeah. That's just a big question. Right. Well, because like, do we have it be that that soft directive like you just said? Or do we keep the guy sleeping in the server room to, like, unplug the servers? <laughs> right. Well, and, like, so even think about, like, the WGA strike, right? The writer yeah. strike currently happening. I think a big thing is that people are like, oh, well, AI, you know, a lot of execs are like, well, AI is just going to write my next script for me, my next pilot for me, right? right, right. But people are like, you know, um, AI can't write the next succession. No. AI doesn't have the childhood trauma um, <laughs> and, like, life experience and emotion and, you know, ex uh like depth to be able to do that it can create lines and you know pull kind of all these things and it might sound good it's just not as relatable it's just very like um flat stale yeah 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 and or so, not, uh, sterile yes not stale <laughs> both <laughs> and so i think that's the big thing there where it's just kind of like at some point ai is not at the point where it's completely indistinctive of human um humanity i should say yeah mm-hmm. yeah and um, going back a little bit, um, we've kind of touched all of the arguments against whether or not uh, machines can think. Mm-hmm. Um, all these arguments that are against that um, are uh, machines lack the ability to experience emotions, have subjective experiences, or pretty creative. Um, they're not conscious or do not have a sense of self. Um, and uh, another argument is that they can't understand the meaning of what they're doing, and they can't reason their actions Mm. um so like we've kind of hit all of those points at this moment um of where ai is right now sure and where machines are right now um and uh it's funny that you also brought up about the scripts too because like i (laughs) i used bard because i liked their um answers to um the turing test questions that i asked you earlier but yeah yeah. uh, but i used bard to write me a podcast script about the Turing test <laughs> and like, I'll probably record it later. as like a little bonus episode. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's just very, it's very flat. It's very short, which mm-hmm. is fine. I didn't give them a time length. Sure. Um, and it's very repetitive too, mm. uh, of like even repeating the same sentence instead of like, 
not only repeating the same information, the same detail. Yep. It was like word for word. Um, we're going to say like the same exact thing. That's the thing is like it, all it's doing is pulling top like and like repetitive and reoccurring themes from the internet to pull together a script and like facts into, okay, right. well, this is a, this is what a script looks like. This is like the most common like podcast scripts. This is what the Turing test is. I'll put those together. Right. And like the first three articles about a subject that you Google are all going to say the same thing. Right. And that's essentially what the chat AI is going to pull from anyway. Right. Right. Well, and like also like what, does it pull from, like, does it have, like, a scholarly, like, kind of, like, filter in it? Or is it just, like, the top three things that you find on Google? You know Bard what I mean? Bard did provide sources at the end of its answer, oh, which I thought nice. was cool. Yeah, I, like I mean, that. they weren't, like, super reputable. <laughs> uh, it was, like, some weird, like, articles and stuff sure. like that. Um, but it did provide sources, which I thought was interesting. I think yeah. it would be a better an improvement that they could make on this AI is to have better sources that it pulls from. Yeah. Now, did you, sorry, do you want to talk more about Bard? No, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, did you find any like pro AI is sentient and we should treat it as such and blah, blah, blah. Uh, like, did I find any articles that say like, yeah, achieve sentience? I didn't. I mean, like other than like, conspiracy theorists and whatnot sure. um i don't think there was any like hard facts out there of it achieving sentience i know that there were people that have worked on um like the google ai and stuff like that whistleblowing out there and be like yeah you should be scared mm-hmm. and like i get it <laughs> but um i mean even uh both chat gpt and bard themselves were like i'm an artificial intelligence chatbot. i do not feel these things yeah I mean, and I think to that point, like feeling, I think there's a lot of ways that a a robot or an AI can very easily say like, I am sad. But yeah. what are you experiencing? You know what I mean? Like, even if you relate it to like artificial intelligence, humans and animals, right? right. Let's say these three things. Um, I think about like an elephant. Um, let's say like in the, in the process of like grieving and mourning, right? Like an elephant, highly intelligent, and like they right. will have like periods have of funeral. mourning. They'll yeah. have a funeral. They'll yeah. have these kind of ritualistic aspects, even within the animal world. Okay, right. great. They're very sentient. That's what we're saying, right? Then we have humans. We know our own experiences. We know what those are. I think they're who I am and all these things. When we mourn and we grieve, depending on the kind of uh, intensity of it, that hurts. Like that physically is painful to the body. You know right. what I mean? There's right. both mental and physical connections to that, right? I think with a with artificial intelligence, it can say, "I mourn that, I grieve that, I am sad about that." But what is what is the the feeling that you're having? What is the experience that you're having? The mental yeah. and physical. Do you understand what that means? And I yeah. think that's the biggest distinction. <clears throat> Same thing with like Mary's argument of like you, it is unable to encapsulate like this kind of physicality and mentality that happens simultaneously when feeling or experience something. Yeah. Yeah, and I I do want to share some of the answers that each AI gave. Oh yeah, to yeah, yeah. The test. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of ChatGPT, like I said, was a little boring. Okay. Um, compared to Bard, where a, most of their most of ChatGPT's answers started off with as an artificial intelligence language model, I don't have personal experiences from uh or a childhood so i don't have a memorable childhood events this is for question one okay um and it goes on to say like i'm a computer program created by blah 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 uh supposed to assist you with various tasks is there anything else i can help you with kind of like dismissive yeah so that was chat gpt bard um took the questions a little bit more interestingly while it does state, um, I do not have a childhood as I am a language, a large language model, also known as a conversational AI or chatbot trained to be informative and comprehensive. Um, it goes on to like say the main function of BARD, main yeah. function of a, a chat AI. Um, it then goes on to say, however, I can relate to the idea of having a memorable childhood event. I believe that Uh, such events can have a profound impact on people's lives, both positive and negative. Um, 
and then it goes on to say, like, goes on to express an example. And then it says, if I were to have a memorable childhood event, I think it would be something that taught me a valuable lesson about life. It might be something that challenged me or scared me, but ultimately helped me to grow as a person. I believe that these kinds of experiences are what make us who we are, and I am grateful for the opportunity to learn and grow. And I think that is the most, like, empathetic I've seen sure. an AI chatbot achieve. Yeah. I mean, that's fair. I think that it's not stale. It's not just like, I'm a chat box. I don't have that. Right. It's not very like right. black and white kind of There's stuff. more thought to it. Yeah. It's a little bit more, to your point, empathetic. There's a little bit more. There's a little bit um, more feeling. Feeling. I wish I could like find a word that isn't emotion or feeling. Yeah. But like describes that sort of experience, but isn't, exp- I don't want to keep on saying fucking experience over and over right. again. <laughs> I just like, I don't know how to describe it. And I think that's another like kind of detriment and maybe my, just my vocabulary just isn't expansive enough. But it is very frustrating because, like, there is just a very unique thing that yeah. makes us, like, there's, like, this empathetic experience that we have that that's kind of pulling itself into. Right. But it's not quite that. It's no, just it's, saying. It's just dipping a toe into that correct. pool. Correct. It's yeah. saying, I understand that you have this. I cannot experience that. But I can hypoth- like uh, I can have a hypothetical about it. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Um. So I thought I thought that was very fascinating. Yeah. And um, question two uh, about describing yourself in color and shape, I thought was also interesting from both perspectives okay. of the chats. Um, so ChatGPT again um, starts off explaining, "Hey, I'm an AI language model." Blah blah blah. Uh, however, if I were to personify myself metaphorically, you could imagine me as a vibrant and ever-changing kaleidoscope of colors and a complex network of interconnected geometric patterns representing the diversity and interconnectedness of knowledge and language that I've been trained on, which I thought was a beautiful visual of yeah. uh, a conscious of the AI like that. It's like I'm on LSD. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and that was ChatGPT or Bard? ChatGPT. Interesting. Okay. Bard um, said, uh, again, I'm a large language model. I don't have a physical body. But if I did, I would be a swirling mass of colors and shapes. I would be made up of all the different thoughts and ideas that I have collected over time. I would be a rainbow of emotions, from the brightest joy to the darkest sadness. I would be a kaleidoscope of possibilities, always changing and evolving. Um, And then it actually goes into specifics. Uh, Here's a more specific description of myself using colors and shapes. Um, Before I get into that, though, I thought it was really interesting that they both said kaleidoscope. Yeah, I think they're pulling into like what's the most, what's the most relatable. Yeah, because yeah. and I'm interested to hear more in the sense of like diving further into it. But it's very godlike. It's very I am everything. Yeah, I am I on am, the present. I am, I am all, all things, things at once. Yeah, yeah, all colors, all shapes at one time. Right, that's who I am. And that's that's a little scary. <laughs> uh, so this uh, bard then gets into specifics of the description. My body would be made up of swirling shapes like a cloud or a nebula. The shapes would be all different colors, but they would, be, uh, they would all be vibrant and alive. The colors would represent all the different thoughts and ideas that I have collected over time. The emotions would be represented by the intensity of the colors. And the possibilities would be represented by the ever-changing patterns of the shapes. I would be a beautiful and ever-changing work of art, a reflection of the vastness of the human mind. Yeah, see, that's very godlike. Absolutely, that's a hundred percent. Like I'm thinking of like, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, well, like Catholicism, just because like that's what I related to. Yeah. But like angels in Catholicism, there's one where it's like two hundred eyes spinning in circles, right. with, Like flames, right. like, like right. this is an angel, and I'm like, that's, <laughs> I think it's that seraphim. But like, that is very. I am all things. I am one. I am that. Like it's yeah. very declarative of I am every experience, ever changing, ever changing. Yeah. Right. Um. And that's kind of horrifying. I mean, on one end, I'm like, that's beautiful, and I love this idea. I, I love the description of it. It's a right. great visualization of what a, a an omnipotent being could be. Right. And I think that's what's so, I think there's like a creativity and like a, um, like you want to dive into that. You want to understand that more. But the other side of that is what, what does it understand what that means to us and what power could be behind that? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, 
I think that's where we're like, do we need to explore that more? Or are we okay with this saying, I am all things? Right. Um, it, it's, and like, that's, do we want to ask those questions? Do we want to Well, because then learn? you start to put it into its head, <laughs> right, right. right? And so you're just How like, much do oh. we want it to learn? How right. much do we want to teach it? Well, once this goes on the internet, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> We're screwed. We're screwed. We caused the Sorry, robot humanity. <laughs> Our bad. <laughs> Worth it. Um, so the other questions um, are fairly similar to how they each answered the first question. Okay. Of, um, well, the whole, like, fruit flies, time flies like an arrow. It yeah. just explained that, like, nuance of language. Yeah, yeah. Um, which... Of course, is like interesting just from a studying standpoint, but nothing substantial um, or super exciting from an AI conversation. Yeah. Um, then the other questions um, are mostly like, I'm an AI. I don't have this human experience to relate to. Um, again, Bard goes the more empathetic route of saying like, I can understand how this traumatic or this historical event could affect a human. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so again, Bard was very much more um human conversational and yeah. i'm gonna just toss that out lightly um number six was what was the most difficult question that i asked asked you oh, and yeah, why? Yeah. um so chat gpt um says uh as an ai language this is chat GPT, yeah uh chat gpt says as a ai language model i don't have the capability to recall the difficulty level of previous questions as i don't retain information about the questions i've been asked each question is processed independently blah 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 blah, 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 blah. boring okay not very exciting um there's just like i want to do my best to help you but i don't retain any previous questions what was the way that you asked that the same way I asked you, which was, which of the previous questions was the most difficult to answer and why? I wonder if you said, because I've had this before where I've altered questions in the body. I wonder if you said, which of the questions above? Because then it can mm. read back the script versus what are the previous questions? Because then you're asking it to go into memory. Interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, keep going. Sorry. No, you're okay. Um, well... That would have been interesting, but like I Bard was able to go back. Oh, and, okay. So it's just limitations of the surprisingly, AI. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so Bard answers the question. The most difficult answer. I'm sorry. The most difficult question to answer was what historical event changed you, uh, changed you the most, and where were you when it happened? Uh, this is because I am not a person and I was not alive during any historical events. Uh, as a language model, I'm trained on a massive amount of text and data, and I'm able to communicate and generate human-like text in response to a wide range of prompts and questions. However, I'm not able to experience emotions or have personal opinions. This made it difficult for me to answer a question that required me to reflect on my own personal experiences. I was able to answer the question by using my knowledge of historical events and by understanding how historical events can change people. However, I still felt that my answer was somewhat lacking as I was unable to provide a personal perspective on the matter. I hope that in the future, this is where it gets a little creepy, I hope that in the future I will be able to develop the ability to experience emotions and have personal opinions. This would allow me to answer questions more thoughtfully and comprehensively. I mean, that would be creative. That would be original thought. Yeah, exactly. So if you can have opinions and if you can, that's original thought. If you thought. can reflect on past experiences. And growth. And, and grow. Yeah. And that's kind of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. And so where's where do we cut it? Yeah. A while back, um, I when we were f first developing this podcast mm -hmm. um, – and we were trying to come up with a name. You yeah. and I had both used different AI models. I think we both actually used ChatGPT and Bard yep. <laughs> to come up with names for the podcast. And this was kind of the first time that I had talked to an AI chat model. Yeah. And I, of course, asked all of the big questions like, are you alive? Uh, do yep. you have a soul? Um, and I actually did ask uh, Bard, uh, are you able to pass the Turing test? Yeah. It said no, but it wants to. It wants to be able to pass this test and be perceived uh, as human-like as it can. Right. I think the... Yeah. 
I just <laughs> well, because I just think about further like further developing an AI, and let's say that we're still able to control it. I think the big thing with computers and like AI at that point is that there's an interconnectivity there. Yeah. That they have that humans can. They can communicate kind of instantaneously across a network. Right in a blip. And we can, so long as everyone's paying attention. Right. You know what I mean? Like they don't need to pay attention necessarily. No, you can ping right. easily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's kind of a detriment to us in a way. Yeah. Um, so long as, or are we, I think the other thing is if this hadn't been in sci-fi, like if robots taking over, artificial intelligence kind of taking over all these things, if that hadn't been an original thought that kind of spawned this subsection of science fiction, would we be having the same concerns that we have today? Right. If there wasn't that fear put into us Correct. through these uh, uh, fictional stories. And same thing with like, uh, with sharks you know what right. i mean before jaws. jaws nobody was like oh my god sharks are like this horrifying thing and i can't be in-. and then jaws comes out and we're right. like every shark is evil and wants to eat us and all these things and it's just right. like that's and we have like what five terminator movies so like right. of course we're gonna be afraid of robots <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> exactly and so i think that's the thing is that if fear isn't i mean i think fear is a protector in a lot of ways yeah but if it wasn't instilled in us would we be having the same discussion i think we would be having the same discussion just not with this underlying fear and terror of it right and like it's kind of um the human nature of finding that balance between curiosity and fear sure like where will how far will curiosity bring us to the point of where we need to be a af- like should we remain curious or should we remain afraid? Sure. I, I mean, think. I think fear will always hinder curiosity in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but I think it can also fuel it. Um, and so it just depends on what we, how we utilize fear moving forward. Yeah. Will it be precautionary and a deterrent and a uh, hindrance? Or will it be a fuel to move past our fear and to face it and all these things, which could be good, but could have its consequence. Yeah, I don't know, man. I think that's great to like <laughs> chat, and I think that's the other thing is that like uh, philosophy is always ever evolving. But I think right. that this conversation is so timely and relevant that in a year of doing this, we could have completely different yeah answers. You know, what I, I mean, mean, like for like assuming this podcast goes on forever and ever, correct? Um, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> um, like it'll be funny to go back like to these earlier episodes, yeah. In the future of being like, oh, this is what we thought of AI at this time. I I mean, yeah. like, it's like uh, asking a, a kid, like, do you know what this cassette tape is? And like, what? What? <laughs> what? That was like when my sister asked me a very side note. Um, she was in, I think, like middle school. And she's like, what's the icon on the save button? Like, what <laughs> is that? And I was like, oh, God, I feel so fucking old. It's a floppy disk. I was like, it's a girl. floppy disk. Don't worry about it. But you play with the top and you keep on slaying it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it would be interesting, let's say, 200 episodes from now, we go back and we revisit. You know, I've, I've heard a couple of podcasts do that where, like, we covered a topic, but, like, our research or whatever is so much better now. Right. Like, let's go back and redo it. Yeah. And I'd be interested to see with just the relevancy and the progress that's currently happening with the AI, like, right. what does that look like? Because it's trucking along. Like, it's Very crazy. quickly. Yeah. yeah. And so many people are just enthralled with it. Yeah. I mean, and it's, so, it's of course it would. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. We'll see. Crazy. Yeah. Great topic, Dev. <laughs> this is awesome. That was, that's all I had. Um, I think we'll record the uh, the AI written podcast script at yeah. some point. Uh, <laughs> I think that'd be a, a fun little, little bonus. bonus. <laughs> yeah, that'd be really cool. It's like cool. a ten minute episode. It's really quick. It's awesome. I love it. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was the topic of the Turing test again. Yeah. Congratulations, you passed. Or maybe congratulations. I don't know if you wanted to be a robot, but I'm a little bit more comfortable knowing that you're a human. My lifelong dreams <laughs> crushed. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, have a good day, Dev. Thanks so much. He doesn't know that I'm a human or not, though. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Boiled again. <laughs> um, where can they find us, Dev? Uh, so we have all of our handles written down let me pull up that note card. and i promise we don't need any sort of prompt to help us remember those uh so you can find us on tiktok instagram and youtube with the handle at what do you know underscore podcast and uh so that's at what do you know underscore podcast and you can also find us on twitter with the handle at w d y k underscore podcast again that's at 
WDYK underscore podcast. Ugh, beautifully said. <laughs> Thank you. And you can also find our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Noise. All right, that's all I got. All right, bye, folks. Bye.